Too simple job to do to introduce the speaker, and I already finished that. Uh, to introduce uh, our own organization uh, that is it's USJI, and it's uh, NPO established in um, 2009, and believe it or not, we are expanding our membership. The five university started this NPO. And I can't tell you which universities are joining, but plural universities are joining at this particular moment. In the one week time, we will be making an announcement. It will be on the home page, but the number will be bigger. It implies that our loudspeaker on the way Japan thinks on various issues the loudspeaker is going to be, I hope, louder and quality improved and you will find. And I would like to welcome you here all. And let's give him uh, uh, 30 minutes to speak and then we will have 30 minutes to question him or discuss with him on the issues uh, concerning China relations, and Japan and China issues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Abe, for your kind introduction. And, um, it is, as usual, a great honor um, to uh, speak in Washington, but this is my first time to speak um, at the U.S.-Japan Research Institute, uh, which is a very important um, experiment for a number of uh, leading Japanese universities, including Waseda and uh, Tokyo, among others. Um, to, um, to work on um, and bilateral and multilateral engagement um, in, in Japan studies, but not only Japan studies, from a regional perspective. And I'm very happy to be here. I'm also happy um, to see uh, many um, old friends, and I'm not talking about the ages here. <laughs> uh, and um, and um, uh, uh, the trouble is that I got used to Washington. Uh, I grew up in the uh, suburbs, of the new, suburbs of New York. And uh, when I moved here um, more than 15 years ago uh, as a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center, I couldn't get used to DC. Uh, nobody made faces. Everybody was polite. Our neighbor brought a wonderful apple pie uh, as newcomers, and uh, nobody's eyeballs rolled back. I, mean, I, I thought I couldn't live in this place. I mean, you, you're not used to, you were not supposed to use four letter words, which was used abundantly in Europe, New York, and New Haven. Uh, but um, it turns out that I've been spending much more time in Washington than in New York, and I'm very happy about that. Uh, because I have this back ache problem, you have to allow me to uh, yes. give my talk sitting down. Thanks. Now, um, I, I have prepared a talk uh, with the title, Facing the Rise of China, uh, which is the topic that uh, you hear in Tokyo. Um, Every week, there's, uh, there's uh, some symposium, some workshop titled China, Friend or Foe. And of course, uh, it depends on the organizer. Some people want to talk about the friendship side, and some people want to talk about uh, the enemy side. Uh, but uh, dealing with China um, seems to be a major concern in Tokyo. But that concern goes in various directions. Um, on the one hand, they are very specific concerns about doing business in China, about the difficulty um, facing uh, China's legal framework um, and how it's different from doing uh, business practice in Japan. Uh, there is an irony here because uh, what the Japanese are saying about China is almost exactly the same as what the Americans were saying about the Japanese market, how the Japanese are different, how laws are not as they seem, um, and things like that. So this will go on 
Um, but um, here, at least on the economic side, there is a shared assumption that we can never work out our economy without China. So this is the relationship we have to deal with, and China will remain an uh, important partner. On the other hand, you see uh, more alarming um, arguments that uh, China is rising so rapidly, and uh, we should do something about it. Um, when it comes to territorial debates, you might recall that the most of the coverage about the recent uh, meeting of, uh, of Korean, Chinese, and Japanese leaders, the most of the media coverage was about territory issues. The discussion, I believe, was focused on FTAs, um, but the media coverage was on about territorial issues and how it was covered or was not covered in the debate. Um, the focus here is that um, there is a territorial issue between China and Japan, and if there is not much attention given to that debate, then um, our Prime Minister is not doing his job. There is a kind of a China scare going on in Japan at the moment. I doubt if Beijing is interested in attacking Tokyo at this moment, to say the least. But um, this kind of anxiety can be explained partially by what we call power transition. Um, there is an emerging power, and there is a power that is in relative decline, that um, the erosion of a position held by that power can lead to uh, strong anxiety. Now, whether there is a power transition going on at a global scale, whether American uh, leadership or hegemony is being challenged by China is an open question. But on the regional level, there is certainly a power transition from, um, from, uh, um, from Japan to China. The capital of the Middle Kingdom is now being restored back uh, from Tokyo to Beijing, and some people dislike it. So um, some of the discussion that I would um, give um, today would be uh, quite academic, um, unfortunately, um, based on the research I did with uh, Professor T.J. Pempel of, uh, of University of California, Berkeley, and um, a number of um, scholars in Korean university and public universities. But um, as I'm not really used to academic jargons, um, I guess, uh, I guess um, in the Q&A session and in most of the, uh, most of the discussion, I'll try to offer as much uh, concrete detail as possible. Take a look at DPJ, and you see a wild uh, swing of policy. When Hatoyama became um, the, uh, the new prime minister after a long LDP regime. Uh, his focus was on remaking U.S.-Japan relations and also strengthening relationship with China. Uh, we should be clear from his position on the Kutema base issue and also his uh, focus on East Asian community, whatever that means. Uh, we were never sure what he meant by that. Um, I would argue that Hatoyama's position was more for domestic consumption rather than as an articulate foreign policy. But nevertheless, um, the DPJ regime started um, by focusing on China rather than the United States. Right now, we see the opposite. Kan Naoto, uh, the prime minister who succeeded Hatoyama, was immensely unpopular in Tokyo but somehow um, gained some support in Washington because he was the one who worked on strengthening our relationship with the United States and also uh, changing the policy line regarding the Kutema Airbase. Um, and strengthening the U.S.-Japan alliance was not only supported by, um, by Khan, but also by, the former, by our foreign minister, uh, Minister Maihara, uh, who was uh, almost the, um, the opposite of Prime Minister Hatoyama in, uh, in foreign policy. Um, his argument was a more traditional one by, um, by paying more attention to the threat dimension that China poses. Uh, we should um, strengthen our alliance with the United States. So within a year, our policy changed from um, A to B to the opposite line. This also um, relates to a strong attention in containing China. Um, you can see an example in the Senkaku dispute. Uh, the Senkaku dispute uh, is known, of course, by China's extremely strong words 
denouncing Japan s and arrest of the boat captain that crashed into one of our vessels. But on the Japanese side, this was a case where a strong measure against China was widely, almost unanimously supported by the Japanese public. Now, the question here is, of course, why this pendulum has, been,、uh, has taken place.、Um, the best answer would be to go back to、uh, Japanese domestic politics, but in, instead I will focus on a more wider terrain. If you take a look at power and economy in East Asia, and you see two very different things. On the one hand, you see、um, economic development and trade developing at a tremendous pace. It's not only that the, the economies are、uh, developing, you also see an integration of Chinese and Japanese and Korean markets. In fact, at a far、uh, higher pace. And、compared to our integration to the global market, we see an emergence of an East Asian market in the West.、Uh, so, therefore, we see、uh, interdependence at both、uh, global and regional levels. And this is also accompanied by institutional architecture.、Um, during the past 10 years, we see a development of more policy coordination between the three East Asian nations.、Uh, China was not paying much attention to economic diplomacy. A decade ago. But with,、uh, with the current administration, there's much more attention not only to trade but also institutions that support、um, the growth of trade. So far, so good. The other、uh, side of the coin is that we see、um, balance of power politics leading to limited but very significant anxiety, which of course is、uh, related to the rise of China and the relative decline of Japan. This leads to、uh, two transitions,、uh, both in geopolitics and the economy,、uh, where the center of gravity is moving to China. We may be seeing far transition at both global and regional level, but I would argue that、um, far transition at the regional level, which is from Japan to China, is far more severe and far widely acknowledged than at the global level. From this, we、uh, started to work on three models of traditional analysis, and we found out that、uh, none of the above two are sufficient to explain what's going on.、Um, allow me to、uh, work on political science 101, but、um, the original argument that was put forward by the Manchester Liberals, or Adam Smith for that matter, was that growth of trade will promote stability, as war will become much more costly. And much more meaningless in an integrated economy. That's a commercial piece argument. The other argument is, goes to the other extreme power transition,、um, rise of new powers, and eroding hegemony promote instability. In fact, the original architect of this theory,、um, Mr. Organsky,、uh, proposed a possibility of hegemonic wars.、Uh, whenever there's a power transition, this leads to Hegemonic wars.、Um, this is a rather alarming argument, and I doubt if we、uh, really have to think about it, but that's what Mr. Bogansky said. Now, power transition arguments usually argue that the challenger is much more aggressive than the status quo power. And this、uh, argument has been challenged by、uh, many observers, especially during the past few years. The argument goes. That a power transition may actually lead to preemptive action by the status quo power.、Um, this means that it's better to strike against your enemy before that enemy becomes much stronger. If that is the case, then this is closer to what we have called a security dilemma in international relations. Power transition is unique in the sense that the rising power is more aggressive. Security dilemma. Uh, and actually、uh, talks about something very similar to power transition.、Uh, as all sides may be defensive in their intent, but their defensive realism leads to a spiral of insecurity. Security dilemma is an argument that has been argued very often by Chinese international、uh, relations people at this moment. For obvious reasons, they are afraid about the containment of China,、uh, which may be emerging right now. Power transition is an argument that has been put forward by, by more 
Well, um, hawkish um, people in the United States um, or um, Japan, for that matter. Uh, so we um, try to work out some analysis. Our basic argument it goes like this. The, uh, our first argument is the absence of the security economy nexus, which runs against the commercial peace um, theory. Um, our evidence shows that the growth of trade and investment has not reduced geopolitical tension in East Asia. And, and I'm not going into the details of our research, but this is an alarming finding, because uh, if you follow Adam Smith and the Manchester Liberals, Copeland Bright, or for that matter, Robert Cohen, anybody who talks about interdependence, we would expect that the growth of trade and investment would decrease geopolitical tension. That doesn't seem to be the case. But uh, I would like to add quite quickly that this does not mean that um, the growth of trade and investment has increased geopolitical tension. Some uh, power transition people are arguing along that line, but we do not support that argument either. Um, the argument we have made, uh, which is rather troublesome one for us, is that the geopolitical gain and the economic gain could be more independent than we uh, have assumed before. But we also argue that uh, power transition has been working as a destabilizer, which uh, may not lead to hegemonic wars. Rising policy new opportunities for causing anxiety among the rest. So uh, power transition has worked as, uh, as um, strengthening anxiety over China's role in the region, especially in Tokyo, and on a milder extent to Washington. I doubt if there is much attention on this aspect in Washington, but a lot going on in Tokyo. We uh, have worked on several scenarios. One scenario was commercial peace. I would not go into details. Uh, that um, growth of trade would um, decrease tension, uh, it would spill over to regional economic institution from to geopolitical institution, but also ge uh, geographically spill over from ASEAN plus families to Northeast Asia that the growth of trade would promote uh, greater stability in the region. That's the commercial peace argument. The second scenario is securitizing, as we call it. Geopolitical anxiety would play a paramount role in defining international relations. And therefore, economic uh, competition resource allocation will be increasingly be viewed as a zero-sum game. And geopolitical conflict will harm economic negotiations. And Northeast Asian contestation will spill over to ASEAN plus institution. That's the worst case scenario in many ways. The third scenario, which is closer to what we have found, is the economic security isolation. That geopolitical anxiety and economic interest may be mutually more independent than we have thought. Uh, that the growth of trade and investment would lead to further regional institutions on the one hand. And nevertheless, geopolitical anxiety may disrupt initiatives for regional security architecture on the other hand. So we see the right hand working on peace and the left hand working on conflict, and the two will not work together. Uh, that's, the, that's our rather alarming finding, finding we have found in, um, in our research. Uh, just like I said, um, our first observation is that commercial peace, commercial peace may be possible, but it's not inevitable. Extreme expansion trade volumes in East Asia has not ruled out territorial conflicts or discord over war memories or responsibilities. Now, commercial peace is an easy argument if you only focus on war. For there has been no war between powers where you find greater interdependence. And proponents of commercial peace only focus on actual warfare. This is a possible argument, but this is a very crude argument because wars are extremely rare. In many ways, this is just like the democratic peace argument that uh, stable democracies have not fought each other. And there's good evidence supporting this. But we're not sure whether this argument holds because the case of the wars are limited. If you change the index from war into index of conflict, 
then you see a very different picture. That uh, the, uh, if you take an index of conflict on territorial issues, then you actually see an increase of 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 uh, of um, semi to um, actual territorial um, conflicts between these Asian nations um, as trade volume has increased. And this is an alarming um, um, argument against commercial peace if we expand it to. Um, situation which is not limited to war. And the second observation is that power transition invites instability but not necessarily war. And, and this is an important point I'm, I'm making. Um, Organsky and his school have focused on the possibility of hegemonic wars. And I do not think that there is an imminent danger of interstate war in East Asia. But uh, this also means that power transition can be seen uh, in, uh, in, in a larger context that may be related to increase of instability. And we worked this out. And uh, we have found some indications that the rising economic power would see new opportunities in the use of newly attained power. And the declining powers will eager, be eager to keep vested interests. And therefore, power transition will enhance the probability of negative linkage between economy and security. Now, these are not really nice arguments. And um, expanding this on uh, this unnice arguments, we do see a move toward regional realignment going on in East Asia at this moment. Before 2010, 2010 was a critical year. Um, we observed an expansion of trilateral and multilateral trade institutions, including China. This was uh, a triumph of engagement policy, especially after China signed up WTO and joined WTO. There has been remarkable um, developments in the legal um, um, infrastructure in China. Whether those um, laws are actually kept in practice is, is a problem. But nevertheless, uh, the Chinese are quite correct in saying that there has been great um, institutional developments, not only uh, internationally, but also domestically. And this move was welcome in Tokyo and Washington. But after 2010, and I, I, have, I have to say that this, um, this economic move has not uh, been challenged so much. But we also see a strengthening of US alliance networks that does not include China. The security network in East Asia was essentially bilateral. Uh, U.S. and Japan, U.S. and South Korea, and uh, U.S. and Australia, uh, to mention a few. Uh, we are now observing a move toward a more multilateral um, security architecture uh, by um, the uh, powers establishing relations outside the United States. Australia and Japan already have a security agreement. And we believe um, the same is taking place between South Korea and Japan, although I doubt if it will take form of a treaty, um, because there's much, much opposition in, in South Korea about the legal basis of, of security relations between South Korea and Japan. So in many ways, um, the alliance network in East Asia is moving toward a semi-NATO-like institution, where NATO being much more multilateral than bilateral. So right now we have two sets of institutions going on. In the economy sphere, we see a, an attempt to accommodate China as the largest economy in the region. And geopolitics, we see a move toward containing China. And the argument that I'm trying to make here is not that we can and we should and we are going to contain China. And also we are, no, the argument is not that we can and we should and we are accommodating China. The trouble is that we're doing the same two things simultaneously, and the situation that may ensue happens. Add to this um, is the question about domestic politics. And I believe this is far more important, actually, than the framework I am talking. This is a trouble that happens with every theoretical exercise. Our book was supposed to be, uh, uh, supposed to be a challenge to both power transition theory and commercial peace theory. And to that extent, I think we have been more or less successful. But I doubt if we gave a good explanation aside from the more mundane explanation uh, that goes back to domestic politics. Um, I, um, 
I'm sorry about this, but that's how it came out. Um, it's not published, by the way. And, and uh, in the revision of the papers we're doing, we are more focusing on recent developments in domestic politics in China, uh, Japan, uh, South Korea, with very good reasons. Because this is the best way to explain things. Um, the trouble is that IR scholars are always less important than uh, those who work on domestic politics. Shame. Um, China, since 2008, has been uh, paying more attention to core values. Uh, they have paid less attention uh, than the original uh, five years of Fujintang in international agreements. Um, and domestic public opinion uh, has been more or less supportive of assertive foreign policies. Um, I doubt if this, play, this will play a major role in redefining China's policy, because after all, China is a bureaucratic state, uh, which can easily dismiss public opinion. But the trouble is, public opinion that is um, aggressive against foreign powers is somehow allowed, especially by local power, uh, local Communist Party chieftains, and that is an alarming move. The same can be said in Japan in a very different manner. Um, Japan since 2009 shows domestic roots of US-Japan revisionism in many ways. And um, I would dare say that the roots of Hatoyama is still very much there, and uh, here I would depart from those who argue that Cha Hatoyama was a socialist. No, Cha Hatoyama is not a socialist nor a communist. But Hatoyama does represent uh, a move within the conservative uh, circle who wish more autonomy in U.S.-Japan relations. East Asia community was essentially for domestic consumption uh, by projecting an image of a more autonomous Japan that uh, works as a bridge between U.S and China, uh, you, you may recall that this is almost identical to what Nohyeon talked about in his foreign policy. Uh, this also means that um, because of um, domestic um, influence, our policy in East Asia would, uh, would um, face more fluctuation in the future. Um, DPJ regime is something like um, a comeback of LDP. Um, the DPJ government is a long and painful move from non-LDP politics to LDP politics. What we see in DPJ is almost identical to what the LDP has been doing. To some, including myself, this is good news because we do not want the um, terrible um, disruption that took place with Mr. Hatoyama. But this also means that um, the DPJ regime would face a very strong opposition, not only from the opposition party. By the way, LDP is getting to be a very opposition party-like party right now. It's, uh, it's almost painful to watch the LDP becoming more DPJ and the DPJ becoming more LDP. Um, I just, I'm not sure if it's shown uh, here, but I just uh, published a uh, column in Asahi Shimbun arguing that yes, uh, Japanese political uh, parties are not organized along policy lines, but no uh, political parties are quite consistent in policy preferences in the sense that the ruling party always follow the same policy and the opposition party always follow the same policy regardless of what, pol what party that opposition party is. So, um, hmm, we're not out of the woods yet. Um, Hatoyama is out, but I doubt if the fluctuation coming from domestic politics is over in Japan. And also, I am alarmed that power transition, which is far more severe in East Asia from China to Japan, uh, from Japan to China, has changed our perception toward China. Um, I'm running out of time, but take people like, for example, Nakasone. Nakasone was in many ways a nationalist, I mean, in many ways even a revisionist. Although he was a pragmatic politician who treasured our relationship with Washington, he was one who did not want to talk about war crimes against the United States. It's a very strange um, feature. On the one hand, uh, he's working on a very stable relationship with the United States, but when it comes to wartime responsibility, he was not likely to accept wartime responsibility against the United States. But uh, Nakasone was one who was quick to admit Japan's responsibility in attacking China. A strange combination, a strange combination which was proved to Nakasone because Nakasone really took China 
as a credible challenger against Japan's position. China was a minor power who should have gained more respect among Japanese circles. And he was very much against a brutal um, invasion of China. But then there was a patronizing element in Nakasone's view over China. Compare Nakasone to Abe, for example, and you see something totally different. Abe, of course, was a pragmatist. So the irony is that Abe uh, worked out our relationship with Beijing in a far better way than Mr. Koizumi, who was not a nationalist at all. But um, Abe, in his uh, personal creed, is a known China hater. And um, he is one who has been um, dismissing all arguments against Japan's responsibility of war against China. Although he was quick to accept the responsibility of the attack against Pearl Harbor. The difference between these two, I believe, um, has somehow reflected the difference or power relations that they um, pay much attention to. For Nakasone, China is not a challenger. For Abe, China is a major challenger, uh, which many Japanese um, pinkos, including myself, have not paid much attention to. And he's, uh, he is very much um, concerned about this lack of that attention against the rising China. The real question is how we can contain this, um, this um, consequence of power transition in shaping our foreign policy. We have good news. Uh, my talk uh, up to now may have sounded rather alarmist, but I do not think we um, can, uh, uh, things will get out of hands. For power transition, geopolitics and economy should be distinguished. China is rising in economy more than in military. The Chinese colonels and high officers may use um, unnecessary uh, language, like for example, you take this side of Hawaii and we take this side of Hawaii, so we are all, both good. And one Chinese official did say that, he was on the record. But um, you, can't, you take a look at China's military capability, and it's not even par with that, uh, that Russia has at this moment. China is also weak in terms of, of, of alliance network. Because if there's one ally that China has, that would be North Korea. And if China uh, fights with North Korea, that would be the end of China's survival. China's power is more significant in economy, and the language they use is quite different. For you take a look at their language in G20 meetings, and they keep on saying that China is a developing nation, so therefore we are not ready to accept this and this. Uh, this is a familiar terrain for Japanese because this is identical to what Prime Minister Ohira said when, uh, when he attended the uh, summit meetings. We are not prepared to assume responsibility. Um, the, this is bad news because China is not, uh, not ready to assume responsibility, but this is also good news because China is not, um, China is not being confrontationist against uh, major powers in terms of economic and development. So therefore, uh, we have um, good reason to believe that the institutional um, development in economic diplomacy in East Asia, and for that, ma that matter, that includes uh, global institutions, will, will move forward. The bad news is that um, possible securitizing can uh, take place with power transition. Take, for example, cancel in rare metal supplies. The Council on Rare Metal Supplies, of course, was a problem for many Japanese corporations, and we're not happy about it. But the way this was interpreted um, in Tokyo uh, was far more extreme than the councils and the supply itself. This was taken to be a shift of China's economic policy for, uh, to one that pays more attention to strategic purposes. In short, they are working on a zero-sum game using and manipulating Tokyo. And this is something that uh, we would expect to come in the future. The conclusion here is, uh, is not to uh, prepare for a uh, coming war with China. No, that is so far away from my interest. The argument here is a very straightforward and very simple one. Commercial peace is not inevitable, meaning that we do need actual policies that can build the nexus between the political capital gained in the increase of trade and investment to actual 
betterment of relationship between China, South Korea, and Japan, and the United States. This would be a very tall order. Um, an alarmist view would be something like this, um, and this we, you would not like. Um, there is a very serious uh, territorial dispute um, based on fishery. Um, and um, the Vietnamese, the Filipinos, South Korea, and Japan are eager to um, strengthen our alliance with the United States for the purpose of using American power to contain Chinese actions. And I doubt if Washington is happy about uh, China's activities in the blue waters. But having said that, I I'm also quite certain that Washington is not keen for prolonged conflict with China at this moment, and Washington does not be, like being used by allies' interest. The trouble is that this line of a potential containment of China has been proceeding independently from what has been taking place in trade and investment, which is very, well, very weak. And the question here is how we can build a nexus between the two. I think I have talked too much, so I'll end my talk here. And um, so much for the academic talk. Thank you very much for attention. So how should we do this? Yes, please. Yes, yes. I think IR 101 became 701. <laughs> and I thought it was excellent. Any questions? Uh, let's take, uh, let's hear our first question and then. Could you identify yeah, yourself? Sorry. Russ Stanley, now teaching science. Nice to see you again. Uh, my question goes to your last point. How do you build that nexus? between the economic interdependence and the growing geopolitical yes, yes, tension. Yes. Is that a leadership function? Mm -hmm. And particularly with politics in Japan and a very confused state, how, how do you avoid just letting events take over and not trying to, to, to manage them? Yes. yes, I should. Yes, Because um, I gave a talk without conclusions <laughs> or prospects, and um, I'm guilty uh, for not um, making that point. Now, I, I did a roadshow of this at the State Department last year. And, and, uh, and in my um, previous um, talk, I had a concluding part, and I'm not satisfied with my conclusion, so I'm very shy in talking about it, but let me try. Um, because a book needs a conclusion, a talk needs a conclusion. Um, um, so you see, I'm an IR teacher, and, um, and I talked about my back pains, and my uh, doctor uh, gave me uh, those uh, graphic evidence showing me that my back will never be the same as before. Uh, and, uh, and actually, I knew about it before I went to the doctor, so I asked him, uh, well, I'm going to do something with this pain. Um, his response was, well, um, pain, well, um, I think you can, uh, you, you have to uh, live with it. Um, I disliked his answer, so I had to say that, well, your work is very similar to what I do in my <laughs> So, um, so um, bear with me if my answer um, to your question is, uh, is, is an unsatisfactory one. Uh, one thing, and I really truly believe this is necessary, is to build a bipartisan realm of foreign policy. And I, I am aware that I am dreaming. I am aware that I am dreaming. Uh, but um, but um, a, a bipartisan, but without building a bipartisan realm in foreign policy. The fluctuation of domestic politics will always remain the same, and, uh, and that would push foreign policy to this way and that way. Um, this is essentially a um, question of, of trust, but this is also a function of, 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 of multi-party competition. Um, this is wishful thinking, but I don't think this is uh, totally um, complex. Um, as you can see in the LDP right now. LDP is in a very strong position to win the next government. Now, the younger members um, in the LDP are eager to work against um, DPJ's foreign policy line. Some of them are actually populist and quite similar to Hatoyama's. Uh, but the LDP chieftains are somehow containing this demand uh, for, the, for the very simple reason that if they become the ruling party after the next election, 
they have to change their policy. Um, this is about a region where multi-party competition has been extremely volatile. So there was a winner-takes-all politics, and the ruling party would do whatever they want to do. And there was no consistency within the um, intra-party debates. I think the uh, political party system in Korea is, is stabilizing much, uh, much quicker than in Japan right now. And although there is still a socialist bloc, and there is a socialist bloc in, in the Korean parliament, um, their position has become much more pragmatic than before because they are in a position in the next, uh, next government. I doubt if they will be successful. Um, the populist parties uh, do not really have a much chance in the next presidential election, I think. Uh, but as the intra-party um, inter relationship become much more stable, there would be an almost inevitable lead to a limited but important um, bipartisan scheme. Now this is a wishful thinking. Um, the second one is a bit more, a more pragmatic and very important. Um, it's the role of summit talks in East Asia. Institutions play a role among um, career foreign officers and um, bureaucracies. But when it comes to um, the effect on public opinion, summit talks where political leaders um, meet together have a tremendous impact in showing that stability is actually possible. And regardless of what um, people in uh, Weibo or uh, Twitter um, point out in uh, China or Japan, all those extremist, um, uh, nationalistic, and alarmist um, Opinions. You take a look at public opinion polls, and you see much more attention to the status quo. And whenever you take a look at the public opinion polls after the summit talks, and this is a strange thing, um, public opinion polls in China pay more attention to summit talks than in Korea or Japan. In Japan or Korea, uh, whether the president or the prime minister go abroad and talk with Chinese leaders, it doesn't occupy much interest. In China, whenever there is a summit, uh, there's always much coverage in the media about it, and this gives an image that stability is expanding in the region. And uh, this does give a certain satisfaction to the public. I do not think the Chinese are ultra-nationalist at this moment. I do think that they favor um, status quo in many ways. Which means, and this is different from the wishful thinking I, I made, sustaining a regular uh, summit meeting in the region play uh, a much larger political role than we may have imagined, especially in case of China. I doubt if this will play a larger role, unfortunately, in the case of Japan, because the Japanese media is much more aggressive in picking up the issue that they cover in the summit talks. Um, the summit talks uh, with China was only focused on territory and nationalism, as I mentioned. So it wouldn't have much impact, but it would have a tremendous impact in China. And when it comes to Japan, uh, and I'll also make the same argument that the Japanese public opinion is still very much middle of the road. And although there is an alarmist discourse against China, it does not occupy the middle of the road opinion in Japan at this moment. And the show of stability, stability is attainable and sustainable, has a major impact in the image um, or of all Japanese public as such. Um, this, is, this comes from the public opinion. Do you think our relationship with China is getting better or worse? And people only pick about take this point, take this question. And the more important question is, do you think, um, do you think um, our relationship with China should uh, proceed along the present line? And many people are supportive of that. So although I think uh, um, the um, the, our relationship with alarmist opinions in Japan would be more difficult than in China. Um, with this more uh, attention to the status quo, I don't think we uh, uh, we uh, can uh, 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 we have to um, uh, retreat to alarmist rhetoric. So these small things um, play a large role, uh, but this all ends up in the question of political leadership. When it comes to um, the relationship between people working in the civil service, I don't think there's any problem between Korea, China, or Japan. There are, of course, problems. But the problems are, can be contained within the economic sphere. If you take a look at military officers, and their arguments are quite, um, quite reserved. 
um, Chinese or Japanese or Korean. It is the role of political leaders that present uh, what is going on, that plays a larger uh, impact in, uh, in the society. And I think the only country that has been successful in this respect has been South Korea. Im myung bak is the only uh, president that has retained the support rate from the public, not only in domestic policy, and also, uh, but also in foreign policy, and also projected an image of status quo that is beneficial to um, their country. I must say that both the Japanese and the Chinese political leaders have massively picked in their public relations uh, this, um, uh, in this aspect, and, uh, and I think we have to work on that. Yes, please. I'm the new ship's name. Yes, uh, Kunio Kikuchi from uh, Washington Research and Analysis. Thank you very much for a very uh, perceptive and uh, enlightening uh, discussion of the two countries' relations. But it seems to me you cover the near history, and then you are you are discussing what my, what the status is today. But going, I'm interested in what you see as uh, China, especially. Uh, in the next 10 to 20 years. What kind of evolution in the current political system and uh, our governing system do you see for China? For Japan, of course, 20 years from now, we are going to be a smaller country, uh, barely 100 million, mostly old and all that. What do you see for China and how that relation well, Thank you for a wonderful question. This is something we I work with um, um, professors from five universities. There's a five universities network including China, Korea, and the U.S., uh, Singapore, and Japan. And we uh, we worked on um, Asia uh, after 20 years. Um, and because uh, we could never agree on anything, we came out with uh, several possible scenarios, um, some of which are quite alarming. Uh, one thing um, is that uh, we observe a larger role played by public opinion in each country in East Asia. That includes China, uh, but of course uh, South Korea uh, and Japan. Um, and we differ uh, on our views toward an expansion of the role of public opinion. Uh, with all the reservations, and, I, and my good friend uh, John Eikenberry was essentially positive about the role of a greater role of public opinion in shaping uh, foreign policy. And, and I think I can agree with him if we are only talking about um, 40 or 50 years. Um, I'm, not a, I'm, I'm, I'm not arguing against democracy as such. The point I'm trying to make here is that whenever a government is opening up toward um, the society, uh, an authoritarian government opening up um, to domestic public opinion. Um, the more volatile period is the first period. And um, there is enough evidence and, uh, to show that uh, a larger role played by uh, domestic public opinion um, in the early stages of democratization tends to become more nationalist, uh, more hostile to neighbors. Uh, this was part of the reason why I was a bit uh, reserved in my uh, discussion here. Um, I doubt if Japan would be a minor power, and uh, here I'm not working on my nationalist rhetoric at all. Japan would remain a major power, but will be one of the major powers. The real question about this um, decline argument is about maintaining supremacy and hegemony in the region. And to that effect, I do not think Japan would occupy and hegemonic role in the region. But this is something that uh, we have to live with and we should also accept. And in fact, uh, looking for an hegemonic power dictating policy itself is not a welcome development anyway. Uh, the more important question is that when we lose our hegemonic position, there's nothing wrong about it, I should say, um, whether we can work out a multilateral framework that, uh, that does not place us in, uh, in an inferior position toward a um, demanding power. And this, is, um, this has all to do with China playing a multilateral role in the region. And for that matter, I am extremely optimistic 
there would be alarmist rhetoric and there would be territorial disputes, and I do think that geopolitical tensions will carry on. But nevertheless, the main line of China's foreign policy as participation in multilateral institutions uh, will still uh, remain in that course, for it is immensely beneficial for China's policy at this moment. China is a beneficiary of multilateral institutions. Although they may, they may show themselves as victims um, sometimes of, of pressure from Washington or European countries, essentially China is a rising economic power, so their position within a multilateral institution is increasing. Uh, they're leveraged too. So therefore there is no reason for them to step aside from their institution so long as they are not isolated and they are not contained. So when it comes to bureaucratic politics, I don't think there is a serious uh, issue here. The question, real question is whether we can control potential rifts that can expand from um, um, minor but uh, heated debate, uh, say for example that territory. Right now there is a severe tension between China and the Philippines. And tension is more at the public opinion level than between the governments. I think I'm, um, I'm not wrong in saying that both Beijing and Manila are actually quite concerned about the event itself, but they are not eager to push the issue, although there are people who would very much like to push the issue. When things like this break out, we're in trouble. 2010, I think Washington worked on the right strategy. When, uh, when North Korea attacked Yongbyon, there was much demand from South Korea for revenge, and that South uh, that United States should support uh, South, support South Korea. I don't think this was a practical strategy anyway. But what you did was a joint military exercise with um, South Korea, um, including Japan as an observer. You did it in the Yellow Sea. This was something Beijing did dislike, to say the least. July that year, um, that's, uh, that exercise was scheduled but was postponed because of strong opposition from Beijing. This was a military exercise. This was not a military engagement. This was a show of force, short of war. But the Obama administration consistently um, supported um, a dialogue with Beijing all the way to make sure that this did not develop into an escalating crisis. This was a careful crisis management, I think. Um, this kind of thing can take place. So 20 years, I think it's going to be OK, but there will always be problems unless we try to contain it. And working on this wishful thinking that commercial peace will decrease, such flashpoints, I think, it is dangerous. Uh, yes, Abigail Friedman with the Asia Foundation. Thank you very much for a stimulating talk. Um, to go to uh, Japanese politics, because I think of your, your assessment um, tracks with my sense that, that it's the internal situation in each country that does affect uh, international relations. Um, you seem to suggest that it is uh, um, decisive leadership that is required in Japan to make steps. There are others in Japan, though, that believe that it is structural reform that is necessary, whether it is a direct election of the prime minister, changing Article 9, or electoral reform again. Um, is your sense that those kinds of structural changes are not necessary for Japan to position itself in this new era? Or um, if you could comment on that. I see many hands, so I'll be very brief um, here. Um, I'm not arg arguing against institution changes, although we sh one should never um, overestimate the effect of changes in institutions. In 1993, um, so many of us in political science believed that the change in electoral law would lead to a more stable um, two-party system in Japan. Um, one might say that we're still on the, um, on the path toward a uh, stable two-party system, and that may be true. Uh, but the observations um, somehow overestimated the effect of changes there. Um, 
there are so many things to be changed in Japanese politics, and just a direct election of the prime minister would not bring out that result. Yes, we have a divided government, and yes, the upper house is too strong, and according to our constitution. That is true. But then, does divided government always produce a stalemate in politics? I don't think so. Um, David Mayhew, a very leading um, American um, scholar, uh, a scholar of American politics, um, have pointed out that divided, divided government in, in the United States did not necessarily lead to polarization in politics. And in fact, uh, in effect, many new laws that ran against partisan interests were passed. So um, this is not a thing that, is, uh, that would be popular in Washington these days with um, Tea Parties um, or um, Occupy people. Uh, but there, was, there is the bipartisan realm in American Congress <coughs> that has been essential in keeping the political realm alive. Uh, and, and I'm not arguing against my colleagues um, who are um, designing institution reforms. But I do think that the role of decisions by decision makers themselves would play as important roles as, in, as institutions. I'm not dismissing um, reforms, but I don't think um, that um, alone would, uh, would do. Uh, I'm Richard Lenos, a professor at American University. And in 2010, I was at East Mayhem, and years ago, I was at Goldman Sachs. So I'm interested, in, you know, if we say there's good news on the economy end, and maybe some more questions and tensions in the geopolitical end, in the commercial field, there's also opportunities for tension with fair access to metals, intellectual property rights, uh, contract enforcement, and so on. And the U.S. counts on strong-arm techniques to push those through. How will Japanese industry approach this if there's this division in the soft side of economics versus tension of military? Um, the quick answer would be yes, 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 and, uh, and, uh, and also a dishonest answer would be that that's uh, what my colleague wrote about in the paper and not me. Uh, <laughs> yes, um, yes, um, you're right. Um, interdependence, growth of trade, investment does actually open more opportunity for contestation of conflict. The question here is whether that conflict would escalate into other terrains or whether that conflict would remain in that terrain. Now, um, for, for Ida-san, who is my colleague, um, um, those conflicts uh, concerning trade and intellectual property itself is an issue. And uh, his paper argues that uh, there's no easy way out in the debacle that we're facing uh, with China. Um, and he has a point. He has a point, but um, to me, well, that's not really a big problem, so long as uh, that, uh, that debate remains in, within the social economic sphere, uh, where the international political economy people are talking about. Uh, on this, there will be uh, another realignment going on. Um, previously, there was much more contact with China as, uh, as including China was a path toward the developing economy. But as the difference in open institution between China and the investors become much more salient and related to actual conflicts, there would be two paths of institution building. One would include China, but the other one not including China by showing a higher standard of institution development vis-a-vis -vis China, which China cannot attain at this moment, but which would be an incentive for China to change. And of course, I'm here talking about TPP. Um, I'm a supporter of TPP, but I think TPP was very, very badly designed. I doubt if the Obama administration really had a good trade policy in the first year. I was very alarmed about it. TPP is a move in the right direction. But TPP, um, ha I won't go into the details here. But, allow, but just allow me to say that the TPP should always be open to China, but also show what the Chinese have to do to join a regime of such nature. This kind of alignment that does not include China would go on simultaneously with the one that includes China. In the economic sphere, there's more fear about isolating China than in geopolitics. So I don't think this will uh, end up in a runaway 
um, zero sum game. So I think um, so. Ida san is worried about so many things, but um, he's an IPE guy, and I'm an IR guy. Yeah. And uh, well, what seems so serious to him is uh, it's only about having 200 meetings uh, between US and Japan and Korea and China. That's no big deal. It only means uh, more business class tickets. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the last question. Okay. Ask okay. um, the, the best one. <laughs> uh, my name is Jeremy Cohen. I'm with Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. Uh, my question is with respect to how the energy uh, industry is changing both in Japan and in China with Japan's recent uh, increase in imports and how that might affect trade, trade deficits and also economic growth versus China's massive growth in its electrical production facilities uh, to meet its economic growth and how do you think that might change the relations between those countries? That, that's a big question that, that requires several answers. Um, uh, one uh, and the more important one is that there is a tremendous increase in the, in the demand for uh, new energy supplies in East Asia and that includes um, not only China but uh, many ASEAN nations and Japan in many ways too, uh, which itself uh, is, uh, is making um, the supply of raw materials um, a very acute issue. And this will shoot up the prices. Um, that's answer number one. Answer number two is about uh, relocating uh, Japan's sun industry. Japan's electricity was always expensive. So this really didn't start from uh, March 11, the earthquake. But the March 11 earthquake um, shot up the prices of, of electricity and is expected to shoot up the price of electricity. So the relocation of industrial sec uh, sites out of Japan uh, has um, been increasing. Um, it's, it doesn't really show in the media because everybody is rather careful to downplay uh, what's going on. But it's, uh, in fact, it has been going on for some time. And uh, our, we, our observation is that the relocation is now expanding to firms that employ less than 500 people. Um, uh, firms that employ less than 500 people is our de legal definition of small to medium scale enterprises. And when small to medium scale enterprises are relocating their production sites out of Japan, that has a major impact. Um, and uh, the direction is not only to China, and um, uh, we see a strong move toward Indonesia going on at this moment. Indonesia um, has a pretty stable energy program. It also has an expanding um, market, so that seems to be the side. Uh, the other way to answer your question would be about, uh, about uh, nuclear reactors. China is a wonderful consumer of our nuclear reactors, so we are working on, uh, on a double standard here. In Japan, uh, to be very honest with you, I do not think there is any future of developing a new nuclear uh, power plant in the future, uh, at least in the coming decade. And this also means that the nuclear power reactor may, uh, being a major source of income for Hitachi or Toshiba, they have to find consumers. So if they can, we can uh, sell it to the Japanese, we're going to sell it to the Chinese and the Chinese. Uh, along with um, Turks, uh, Turkey, and many nations are actually uh, paying a, a strongly um, um, interested in the nuclear reactors. So um, on the one hand, I'm, I'm focusing on something that is not a direct answer to you. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yes, there is a competition, a severe competition about energy. But also some people do need, chi uh, do need China as consumers for nuclear reactors. So the relationship would be between more competition and also move for more cooperation. Um, I can give you several other examples like this, but I don't think the move would be uh, uh, one-dimensional. It could move in several directions. Thank you. I think time has come. Thank you very much. It's, uh... Many things, but it came back to one. <laughs> 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 <laughs>